Son, and today we've come to worship in his name. Be with us, we pray, as we find our way once again to the place called Bethlehem, that place where both the hopes and fears of all mankind are met. And now we thank you for Christmas, the day you gave eternal life to all who believe, the day your love was born. Amen. dramatic day in all of history is Christmas, the day that God became personal, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father.
Ah, Christmas. The most wonderful time of the year. Quaint little shops done up like brightly colored packages. Cozy fireplaces dressed in mantles of green. Candles glowing in gaily trimmed windows. And the scrumptious aroma of hot gingerbread. Oh, fresh from the oven. It all adds up, doesn't it? Each brings its own special touch to the wonder and fragrance of Christmas. And sometimes in the quiet places of your memory, you can still hear those old church bells ringing in the good news of Christmas. Christmas Eve, 1818, in the small town of Oberndorf, Austria. The Reverend Joseph Moore was about to prepare his message for the evening service at St. Nicholas Church when he discovered he had a big problem. You see, the church organ was so old and its bellows so worn that it refused to make even the slightest sound. Faced with the dilemma of a Christmas service without music, Reverend Moore sat down and wrote a poem. He handed it to his friend Franz Gruber, who was also the guest organist, and asked him to set it to music. Gruber, working in the last remaining hours, created a rather simple but very sweet melody. That evening, the choir, accompanied by a single guitar, sang the world's premier performance of Silent Night. A while later, when the master organ builder came to repair the old instrument, he discovered a crumpled copy of the tender song. Captivated by its simplicity and charm, he began singing it on his rounds all over the Austrian countryside. News of the little carol spread quickly, and very soon it found its way into the ranks of the immortal. Oh yes, as long as there's a Christmas, there will be a silent night.
Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Have you ever wondered just how long it took for the news of the infant king to travel? Now we're not told that it made the morning headlines or that it was even mentioned in the family section of the news. But we are sure of at least one birth announcement. The Bible tells us that an angel of the Lord appeared to some shepherds in the fields nearby Bethlehem and told them the good news of the Savior's birth. They were very excited, and so they left their flocks and ran to see the tiny baby. They found him there, wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they began to tell everybody that Jesus Christ was born. Perhaps the favorite of all Christmas traditions is that old and warm-hearted custom of giving. Some people claim that presents are only for children, but if we're honest with ourselves, 
we'll all admit to still being children at heart. Grandma starts her shopping months ahead just to find the perfect toy for the perfect grandchild. And then Grandpa ends up wearing it out before Christmas, just making sure it works, of course. And who of us hasn't witnessed the sight of a proud mother adoring her child's magnificent masterpiece of paper mache? As for the fathers, I'm not quite sure where we fit into all of this, unless perhaps to add another painted rock to that unusual collection of paperweights. But whatever it is, or whatever it cost, really doesn't make any difference. Because what matters is that it comes from a heart full of love. Maybe that's why all of this giving serves so well as a simple reminder of the wonder of the Savior's birth. For you see, the real wonder of it all is not that He came, but that He came for us. It has often been said that time changes things, but time can never alter the story of Christmas. In fact, it has barely changed any of the traditions of Christmas. History tells us that since colonial days, Americans have celebrated the season by attending special church services, entertaining friends and neighbors, and decorating homes with evergreens and holly. Gifts were also exchanged, and all kinds of homemade cakes and candies contributed to the festivities. But even then as now, one of the loveliest things in the whole of Christmas was the time-honored custom of caroling. For somehow, 
even in the midst of life's greatest struggles, joy can be found in the song of Christmas. And still today, the angel's announcement is just as alive as it was 2,000 years ago. Fear not, he said, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A small boy filled with all kinds of playful ideas anxiously awaited his father's return from work. An extra long day at the office, however, had taken its toll and his father longed desperately for just a few minutes of relaxation. Over and over again, the boy tugged at his dad's leg with yet another suggestion of something they might do together. Finally, in total frustration, the father ripped from a magazine a picture of the world and tore it into a hundred pieces. Here, he said, handing the child a roll of scotch tape, go put the world back together. 
Ah, peace at last, or so he thought. But in just a few minutes, he was interrupted again. There before him stood his son, and in his hands was a crudely fashioned picture of the world. Son, that's incredible. How did you ever do it? It was easy, said the boy. You see, on the other side of the picture of the world was a picture of a man. And as soon as I got the man straightened out, the world was okay too. One day our Heavenly Father looked down from heaven and saw a broken world, a world that had been shattered into a million pieces by the deadly hammer of sin. But God loved that world and he loved it in the form of a tiny baby who could make it all new again.
Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Then, when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The song of Christmas always has been and always will be found in the name of Jesus, a name so full of power that it makes even the demons to tremble, yet so filled with compassion that its mere mention brings peace to the troubled heart. God gave him that name, a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
Sitting in the warmth of his study one snowy December evening, a tired pastor fell into a short sleep. In his dream, he found himself living in a world into which Christ had never come. There were no such things as holly wreaths or Christmas bells, and no tiny stockings hung by the chimney. In his dream, he walked through the street, looking for other churches, but there were none to be found. Bewildered and confused, he returned to his study, only to find the shelves once filled with books about Christ were now empty. Just then the doorbell rang and two small children asked the preacher to come quickly and visit their dying mother. Hurrying away, they soon arrived at the woman's bedside. The preacher opened his Bible to find a message of comfort, but there was no comfort. There was no salvation. There was no hope. Later in his dream, he stood beside the mother's coffin. He tried to offer some consolation, but again there was none. For there was no promise of resurrection, no place called heaven. Only ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Finally, in utter despair, he bowed his head and wept as he realized he indeed was living in a world into which Christ had never come. Suddenly his dream was interrupted and he awoke to the glorious sounds of his church choir practicing in the sanctuary. What were they singing? Joy to the world, the Lord has come, the Savior is alive. Joy to the world. great joy today, Father, joy in the fact that you kept your promise to a lost world. Even when we were so blinded by our sins, we didn't know enough to want a Savior. Still, you kept loving us. Until that moment, we came and asked you for forgiveness, and then we could love you back. Today, we've looked at a tiny manger bed and even beyond to an empty cross. But someday soon we will gaze upon a throne from which our King rules the heaven and the earth and all in the wonder of his perfect love. Amen. <laughs>